All right, everybody, welcome back to round number four, where I go toe to toe with Dr. Jordan Peterson in his scathing criticism of Marxism and more generally socialism and communism. And so today on our journey, we're going to be looking at a clip titled Jordan B. Peterson on, but that wasn't real communism socialism or marxism exclamation mark end quote this is a video that has about half a million views and it was uploaded about six years ago so it'll be interesting to see where jordan takes us on this fantastical journey but i can only assume he's going to give us a reason why all of us utopian and kind of misguided marxists uh, would ever believe in this type of ideology, this dangerous ideology in the first place, because he's going to give us a psychoanalysis of it. But like, I don't want to preempt what's going to happen. Let's let Jordan do his thing. All right, let's go over to the video. Anyways, back to the postmodern types. Well, you know, this all came, was revealed in such painful detail that even the kind of closed minded ideologue that Norman referred to just quite couldn't couldn't quite muster up the moral courage to keep beating the same damn drum. So what they did instead, being highly intelligent individuals, was play a game of sleight of hand and transform these Marxist presuppositions into postmodernism in the 1970s. And okay, so what he's talking about here is that postmodernism, which came about kind of after World War II and all of that had settled, uh, developed, sorry, yeah, developed from the ideas of Marxism, according to him anyway. And so he's acknowledging here that there is a distinct difference between Marxism and postmodernism. So it'll be interesting to see where he goes with this. And the idea basically was, well, the working class isn't going to rise up and crush the bourgeoisie because, first of all, they're getting rich and that wasn't supposed to happen. And second, well, it sort of seemed to be a catastrophe when that occurred, let's say, in Russia. And so maybe we won't do that anymore because the working class actually isn't buying into this either, which is also a problem. You know, having internalized their own oppression, they wouldn't buy into this to the global myth of the internalize their own oppression. OK, let's go back to something he said just a few seconds before that. This idea that the working class isn't buying into the whole Marxism and the revolutionary kind of outlook of history anymore. Now, this is a very interesting kind of thing that he's brought up because, you know, Marxists were already kind of dealing with this before postmodernism. Lenin himself um, actually dealt with this a little bit in his work. And there's this idea of the aristocracy of labor. So in the advanced countries where capitalism took hold, your kind of your England, your Germany, your Americas, there's this idea that because they actually fought for their working rights and they got better pay and conditions, they've kind of enjoyed the fruits of their struggle and they're not interested anymore with any type of revolutionizing the capitalist system because they're enjoying the spoils of it because they're part of the system. They've been integrated with it and they don't want to change that now. They've got a good deal. So he's take a very, very cynical and rather pessimistic view of what has happened to the working class in developed nations but you know this is what Utopia. he does yeah so maybe it's because they had some sense it's certainly possible but anyways the sleight of hand was oh well fine we'll just play a different oh yeah see and it's just because they had some sense so nothing to do with their actual economic position in relation to capitalism any anymore they just woke up one day as a mass group of people and just were like oh yeah yeah we don't need revolution and marxism anymore let's just move on to something else oh postmodernism sounds good oppressor versus oppressed game and we'll introduce identity politics it's like, okay, okay, you're not being oppressed because you're a member of the working class, you're being oppressed because you're a woman. Or you're being oppressed because you have an ethnicity that's outside the main paradigm, whatever that might be. Um, or it's because of your, 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 your sexual preference or your sexual identity, whatever, whatever places you in some manner outside the normative culture. And, you know, the thing is, the postmodernists, you know, you might think, well, your culture is good for something, it gives you a hierarchy of value. 
it rewards competent people. It gives you a direction so you can climb up, you know, because otherwise everything's leveled to nothing. And then why this is a massive assumption here. And he talks about this often that, you know, uh, free market societies give you this option to basically, you know, move up the social hierarchy. It's called social mobility. And yes, it happens in capitalism as opposed to something like feudalism or a monarchy where you have some overarching authority that gets to decide who lives and dies and climbs the social ladder okay yes capitalism does it way better than feudalism does and then there's this other perception there that for some reason a market economy because you know it just sorts everything out with the invisible hand of the market that like people that are the most competent to do things get sorted out for the most appropriate jobs this is rubbish I've heard him use an example of, you know, a good surgeon being found to be, you know, the most competent person in his industry. So you'd want them to do brain surgery on them or, or on you, sorry. And so, you know, the free market is able to sift through the entire population and pick out the most competent person to be a brain surgeon. Yeah, but like, what about the fact that if this brain surgeon, this, you know, hypothetical brain surgeon, didn't have access to enough money or the right social conditions to get a medical degree in the first place, which is very highly likely in our free market societies. What if they didn't get the opportunity in the first place? We could have had 10 times, 100 times the amount of competent brain surgeons in the first place. This is part of the narrative and the fairy tale that surrounds the free market that he just assumes without actually testing that premise in the first place. So all of his discussion is based on a fallacy, but that of course doesn't suit his argument. So he's not going to go there, but I thought I'd just point that out to you because it's, it's bloody important. They do anything. They don't care about any of that. They don't believe that there's any such thing as competence. They don't believe that there's any such thing as up. This is all, postmodernism wipes all of that out. And so when the postmodernists analyze a text, all they care about is how it privileges the position of the author and who it impresses. And that's the only thing they regard as real. And, and they don't believe in grand unifying narratives. They don't believe that there's a Canadian identity. They don't believe that there's an American identity. They don't believe that there's a Western identity. They don't believe that value structures exist. Or if they are, they're irreplaceable with some other value structure. They certainly don't believe that they have any biological grounding that there's any such thing as a human being it's all socially constructed which is really convenient if what you want to do is be the author of an entirely social constructed utopia that you can run and then when the marxists say well that wasn't real marxism whoa 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 hold on i know what you're gonna say that wasn't real marxism but you just start you just talked about postmodernism. You didn't even take a breath then. That was quite impressive. But you just slammed postmodernism for like, you know, 30 seconds there without breathing. And now you're going to say, but that's not real Marxism. No, it's not real Marxism. And you identified this earlier. Postmodernism and Marxism are not the same thing. So now you just spent a tirade criticizing quite scathingly postmodernism and now you're going to just revert back that they are the same thing that's what's coming watch out I'm, I'm predicting it i'll put my money on it what it really means and i've thought about this for a long time it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make it means if i would have been in stalin's position i would have ushered in the damn utopia instead stalin wasn't a postmodernist what are you talking about like honestly what are you going on about? You're conflating now postmodernism with Stalinism, but you talked about how Marxism and postmodernism are the same thing. Uh, like, how do you lead from one to the other? Honestly. Instead of the genocidal massacres, because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. And you're not that good. And if the power was in your hands, assuming you had the competence, which you don't, well, you wouldn't have done it. That's any better. a massive assumption, isn't it? Oh my God. Assuming you had the competence, 
which you don't. So, like, oh, let's go with the assumption that someone was competent there. I hope he does that. And even if you had, there would have been oh, someone okay. else waiting right behind you to shoot you the first time you actually tried to do anything good. And that's what happened to all the old... And here's the mythology of, you know, what it is to be a Marxist and a communist and all that sort of stuff. It's a bloodthirsty Game of Thrones. And if you actually try to do anything right, someone's going to shoot you in the back. Here's the narrative. Okay, there's no factual basis behind that. He's just talking about people who might be competent enough to do the right thing, but they'll just get shot anyway. Like, and what are you based on that on? Hmm? Absolutely nothing. Old guard who ran the damn revolution. Stalin rounded them all up and shot them, along with their families and millions of other people. So even if you do happen to be that avatar of moral purity that you claim implicitly, the probability that you get to act out your goodness in relationship to those possessed by your ideology is zero. So it's just... Hey, hey, yep, clap. See, it's the ideology that is the problem here. Even if you're a good person, which is what he's saying, and you get into a position where you can do the right thing, you'll just get shut down because everybody else is evil and because apparently that's what communism and marxism does it makes everybody evil except you but you wouldn't get there anyway that's his argument based on just like massive massive assumptions and conveniently reinforcing his conservative messages and his love of the free market so, you know, you think, well, why are these postmodernists doing what they're doing? Why do they So now we flip back patriarch? to postmodernism. What, like, what are you talking? You just talked about Stalin, who is obviously of the pre postmodernist period. And now you're going to go back to start talking about postmodernism like those two things are related. This is incredibly confusing for people to follow. But, you know, that suits his manipulation of this whole discussion broadly. It suits him just fine. It's very, very disappointing, as I've said in the past. Shameful stuff from Peterson. Jim, why don't the feminists complain about Saudi Arabia? It's like... Yeah. yeah. Did you hear the person in the audience? Yeah. Yeah, Arabs. You know, Ooh. God Saad, who's this guy at Concordia who is in a business school, so he can actually say what he thinks now and then. Um, he tweeted yesterday, well... He tweeted to the Women's March, you know, because there's a little Twitter thing. You could do that, I suppose, for the organizers. And he said, why don't you go to the Middle East and have a nice march against Saudi Arabia and see, see how that works out for you? It's like, so you think, well, well why not? Like, what? Why not? Why, why, are the, why are the radical leftists who are so much for rights everywhere, that's what they say. Why aren't they complaining about Saudi Arabia, for example? which, you know, <laughs> breeds a particularly pathological form of ideologically rigid Islam that basically enslaves their women, that's to put it properly. It's like, why not complain about that? Well, how about this? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so when push comes to shove, you see how much concern... So wait, basically his argument is like, we shouldn't ever demonstrate for something on our home soil because it could also be happening worse somewhere else. So we should go there and complain about it first. That is some warped mental gymnastics, if you ask me. Like, honestly, that was, that was something else there, Jordan. Like, I, I am impressed with how you, you manipulated that one and turned it upside down. Wow, wow. I've got a lot to learn from you still apparently dr peterson and there is among the radical feminists for the rights of women it's like if if the pushing those rights forward doesn't also at the same time under undermine the western patriarchy then we'll take the undermining and leave the damn rights behind and so there's an insight for you about exactly what's going on at the bottom of all this so quickly check okay, your okay so then there's another weird thing and i've already sort of hit on it tangentially it's like well, the postmodernists don't believe in grand unifying narratives. They don't believe in narratives at all. They don't care about value because they never notice that you have to value something in, in order to have some hope in life, right? Because you, when you value something, you're, you're pursuing it. And in the pursuit, that's where the meaning in life is, you know?
because the rest of it's suffering. If you're trying to struggle upwards towards the light, it's like, well, that's something to motivate you and to protect you against the suffering. But the postmodernists don't care about any of that, and I would say it's because they don't care about suffering. So, all right, so here, but here's the, here's the final question. It's like, well, if the postmodernists don't care about grand unifying narratives and they don't believe in identity, why in the world are they willing to believe in gender identity and sexual identity and racial identity and ethnic identity? And the answer to that is, well, they can't, but they don't care because coherence isn't on their agenda. And besides- No, coherence is not on your agenda. You've been talking and flipping between postmodernism and then comparing it to uh, Marxism or Stalinism and then going back and forth and, and blurring the lines and confusing the conversation about both. You're incoherent and then you're blaming other people for doing the same thing that you're doing. Like, honestly, where are you going with this? That when push comes to shove, their postmodernism is nested inside a deeper Marxism, and so when the postmodern narrative doesn't suffice, say, to push forward the idea that Western civilization should be overturned, they just revert back to the overarching Marxism and say, well, those people are oppressed and that's a bad thing. It's like you might say, well, you're a postmodernist. It's like, you don't believe in any of that. And they say, well, yeah, I'm only a postmodernist this deep, but underneath that, there's a Marxism, and I can always rely on that to fill in the gaps, and that's exactly... All right, so I think what he's doing here is he is in a roundabout way blaming Marxism for postmodernism because postmodernism developed out of Marxism. And then what he's also saying is that when there's any deficiencies in postmodernism, they conveniently revert back to a form of Marxism. Now, why this is okay, fine, an interesting observation, it's dangerous and stupid for an academic like him to point out because there is this concept in academia of standing on the shoulders of giants. No one, himself included, has ever come up with all of the ideas in a given section of intellectual culture or academia. They use the work of people that come before them and then develop their own theories on top of that. If he is blaming Marxism for giving a foundational basis for postmodernism to then be built upon and then is upset that people dip back into Marxism because postmodernism fails to interpret the world properly, That'd be like criticizing someone like Albert Einstein for having to dip back into previous scientific laws to explain his own theories and then use them again when he makes a mistake and has to develop it further. This is a stupid argument and has no basis for a critique of Marxism because he's upset with postmodernism and identity politics and stuff like that. Really, really crafty form of manipulation. You almost got away with that one, Jordan, but not this time. Mysteries on the case, and we're going to continue to badger you and kind of get at all of the absolute nonsense that you're spilling out just to confuse people to win them over to your side. Very disappointing. Exactly what's happening? Hmm. All right, all right, fine, fine, fine. What can we learn from our mate Jordan Peterson on this one? Well, look, like we've already talked about, he conflates things and uses sometimes, he hasn't in this case, but he uses strange analogies. He's used a strange example here to confuse the conversation and to make his argument stronger. He used an example about Stalin and saying that, you know, People think that they would have done a better job and this is just impossible given the circumstances that surround these types of revolutionary activities, which was clearly a form of understanding and ideology and action that predated postmodernism and used that as a way of arguing that Marxism and postmodernism are both evil, even though he, he took the time to separate them at the start, then conflated them, then tried to pull them apart again. And then, you know, actually, you know what? I don't even know what he was doing at the end there. This is 
just part of his manipulation strategy. So I hope you're starting to see patterns in what he's doing here. And again, I've said it a few times, but like I'll say it again, this is because he is absolutely jealous of Marx's academic prowess and he wants some street cred by knocking him down a few blocks he thinks it's gonna you know cement his position in history and he's upset with these people that use marxism to kind of justify why they don't participate in society in society because it gives them an excuse that hey it's the system's fault not mine and he's big on personal development so he just hates that Marxism gives people excuses. But like, that's got nothing to do with Marxism. That's got to do with him personally. It's very important to point out that nothing to do with Marxism. It's just his observations and his personal attachment to it, but whatever. Look, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And please remember, I am you are, we are a mystery.